Hi, this video is about chapter 13, oscillations. In this video, we will learn about periodic motion, simple harmonic motion, and pendulum and energy conservation, and also concepts like resonance. Okay, let's get started. So periodic motion is basically motion that repeats itself. For example, a heartbeat is a periodic motion because it happens, it repeats itself with certain uh, time intervals. Uh, what you see here is a, a harmonic oscillator. So it's a, basically a mass connected to a spring and that uh, mass is oscillating back and forth. So this is also a periodic motion. Also an apple in water that's uh, bobbing up or down is also uh, a periodic motion. Uh, also pendulum. Uh, it basically swings back and forth. This is also a periodic motion. So the definition of period, it's shown by uh, uppercase T. It's time required for one cycle of periodic motion. So for this oscillator, if it starts from here, so it goes forward and then it comes back to the starting point. So this is the period. So this is one cycle of periodic motion or for this pendulum, it swings forward and then backward. So it comes back to the uh, initial point. So the time that it takes for that one full swing is again, period T. Now, what is frequency? Frequency is a uh, number of oscillations per unit time. So these definitions, the period and frequency, they are actually inverse with respect to the multiplication, inverse of each other. So frequency, you can find it from one over T, or you can find T if you know frequency as one over frequency. So again, period is how much time uh, passes for one cycle of motion, but the frequency is how much oscillations in unit time, so for example, in one second. So the unit of frequency in SI units, the standard units is uh, one over seconds. So for short, it's also called Hertz and it's shown as HZ. So Hertz means one over seconds. We can also define angular frequency. Uh, the difference between frequency and angular frequency is basically just two pi. So if you multiply the frequency by two pi, you get angular frequency. Now these are all related and we can see that relation through this animation. So let's say there's this object that goes around uh, this uh, central point. So if you use your cell phone chronometer and uh, if you time it, you will see that it approximately takes 2.4 seconds for this object to make one full rotation. So then this is the period. So you can start timing from this point or this point or any point, doesn't matter. So one full rotation of this red object, it takes approximately 2.4 seconds. So this is the period. And if you want to calculate the frequency, you basically do one over period. So it's going to be one over 2.4 and the number is uh, 0.4 Hertz. So the meaning of this 0.4 Hertz is that this, so how many rotation in per second? So this object, it makes 0.4 rotation in one second. So that's the meaning of frequency. It's less than one. The reason is in one second, this object is not making one full rotation. If it was making one full rotation in one second, we would have one Hertz here. If it made two full rotations in one second, we would have two Hertz here. But because it's slower than that, it's, it actually takes more than one second to make one full rotation. So the frequency is, so the number of rotations or the full cycle of one full cycle of periodic motion is less than one. And if you convert it to angular frequency, you basically just multiply it by two pi. So this number is approximately 6.3. 
if you multiply this number by 2 pi, you find 2.51 hertz. For angular motion, it's usually angular frequency is used. And the reason is it's related to angular speed. For linear motion, usually frequency is used. The other thing that we can see from the animation is that the rotational motion is actually related to linear harmonic motion. So if you think of this, um, this box as maybe a projection or shadow of this red object on this plane, you can see that it goes back and forth with exactly with the same period. So here's an example. How much time required for one binary operation, such as let's say we are adding two binary numbers for the CPU of which clock speed is 3.9 gigahertz. So for this computer, if you buy a computer, you usually see these things. Uh, it shows the CPU speed. So uh, the clock speed or CPU speed, it means the CPU turns on and off on and off, how many times? 3.9 times, 10 to the ninth uh, times per second. So the CPU opens and closes for this many amount of times in a second. That means in each case, it makes one calculation. So in one second, it can make this many calculations. So, so we know the frequency, let's say we wanna find the time required for one operation, okay? So we're gonna find, uh, we need actually the, the period. So it's going to be one over frequency. So one divided by this number. Notice that I went from gigahertz to hertz. So this is the standard um, uh, units. So hertz is, one over seconds, the same thing. And if you do the calculation, you will find 2.6 times 10 to the negative time, uh, 10 to the negative 10 seconds. So it makes this little amount of time for the CPU to do one binary operation like this. So this list shows a typical periods and uh, frequencies. For example, if you think of a uh, human heartbeat, so usually you have one heartbeat per second. So that means the frequency is one because it happens once in one second. Um, if you wanna ask what the period is, then uh, you ask the question, how much time does it take for one heartbeat, it again takes one second. So there's one second between each heartbeat. So the period is also one second. Um, you can talk about, for example, the, the second hand of a clock. So the period is 60 seconds. So how much time for the second hand to go to make one full rotation? It takes 60 seconds, so that's the period. If you ask about frequency, the question is, how many times the second hand makes one full rotation in one second? So in one second, it doesn't actually do one full rotation. It makes much, much less than one full rotation. So it makes only this much, uh, this much of the full rotation. So this is the frequency. Or uh, we can we can also talk about other other things like the period and the frequency. You can you can see from the list that the the period if period is large the frequency is small. If the period is small the frequency is large. For example, the precession of the Earth. Uh, it's basically the Earth has this north pole and it does this precession. So it's basically the north direction, this direction. In the sky, it moves, but it, it's, its period is 26,000 years. It's, it's a very long time. So we don't notice it in our, in our time. Um, if you ask how much precision 
happens in one second, or how many times that precision one, the, the full rotation, the full uh, uh, event happens in one second. It's, well, it doesn't happen in one second. It takes 26,000 years. So in one second, only this part of it is done. Okay, let's move to simple harmonic motion. So simple harmonic motion is when there's a restoring force that is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. So displacement is this X and K is spring constant. So spring constant is basically uh, a constant of the spring um, and it determines how stiff or how soft the spring is. It depends on its material or how it's made. So this force depends on displacement. So that means at the equilibrium point, at the zero point, so probably somewhere in the middle here, when the, when the block is here, there's no force because X would be zero. But if it's here at the maximum point, the forces that's here, we have the negative sign. The meaning of it is if the position is positive, if the position is positive, then the force is in the negative direction. If the position is negative, like here, then the force is in the positive direction. So that it's, that's a restoring force. So it basically tries to pull the block back to the equilibrium point. So when we have a system like this, when the force is K times X, we call it simple harmonic motion. It's a simple motion, it's also, it makes oscillations. The reason for the harmonic is, is we will see in the next slides that this motion, if we write the position X, we will see that it's related to a cosine, cosine function or sine function. Anything that's related to cosine or sine in math, mathematics, it's, it, uh, we use this uh, term harmonic. So let's see in the next slides, let's dive deep into the math of uh, simple harmonic motion. So if I have this oscillator, okay, it's making simple harmonic motion. It goes to the maximum distance is A, the maximum position, and the minimum position is negative A. So basically it oscillates between these two points back and forth. And if I, if I put a, some type of pen here or a marker, and if I have a paper in the background, let's say I move the paper in the up direction. So I unroll the paper. And while this is doing back and forth motion on the paper, it will draw the sine or cosine. And now you can see that how this why this, this motion back and forth is called harmonic. Again, it's related to sine or cosine, and you can see that sine or cosine is shown here. So you can think of this as, this is the X direction, so it goes back and forth, and this is the time direction. So the position with respect to time, so position is basically XT, it depends on time, uh, this quantifies the position of this block where it is. Maybe we can, we can choose the middle point. So where's that middle point? It could be maximum at A and minimum position is negative A. And of course it you know, depends on time, it changes with time. So it's time dependent. So it will, so the function will be something like this. So there is gonna be an amplitude term. So that's a constant. This is a constant. Amplitude is the maximum or the minimum that this uh, oscillator can go back and forth. So the maximum position that it can go is A, so that is called amplitude. If you can go further, then the amplitude would be larger. Now the second term is, there's a cosine term. So it goes like this, two pi divided by period. So this is the period. What is the meaning of it? Let's remember, it's the time that it takes for this block to go back and forth 
and complete one full cycle of motion. So that's the period. It could be 0 0.1 seconds. It could be one seconds, two seconds. Depend, it depends on the system. And there's this time term. So we can rewrite this as if you want this whole thing. Uh, instead of one over T, remember one over T is frequency. So we can write this as two pi frequency. Or if you remember from the previous slides, two pi frequency is the definition of uh, omega, which is the angular frequency. So you can use either of these forms, they are equivalent. Okay, let's understand this, this cosine function a little bit better. So if I choose A to be four meters, so I have four here. So you can see here, four cosine, and I'm gonna choose period as three. So this is the period. And if I plot this with respect to time, t, then I get a function like this. Okay, let's understand this. How do you, how do you plot this? Well, start with t equals zero. So if I put zero here, then cosine zero is, it's going to be one. Cosine zero is one. Cosine zero is one. So if this is one, then this was four, then I will get four. So if this point is four, then this block is starting at this position. So at t equals zero, the position it's, it's here. Now as, as t passes by, for example, you can take uh, 0 0.38 for t and calculate, put in the numbers in your calculator and then calculate this thing. Um, so because anything that's so any, so cosine is between positive one and negative one. So it will be less than here if you put this number 0 0.38 for T will be, so the value of cosine is, is gonna be uh, between zero and one. So it's less than one. When you multiply it by four, you get a number less than four. For time 0 0.75, for these particular numbers, for uh, when the period is three, then X becomes zero. So it's this point. And if you plug in 1.5, when the time is 1.5, then X becomes negative four, as you can see here. So at time 1.5, three, 1.5, 1, 1 this oscillator is actually, this block is here. So it did half of the motion, right? It didn't do the full motion, but half of the motion. And see how much time passed, 1.5 seconds. It's actually half of the period, so that makes sense because when it makes another 1.5 seconds, when it, so in total, when it becomes three seconds, it goes back to the initial position, which is four meters. So the three seconds mark is here. So this point is three seconds and you can see that it goes back to four. And if you continue in time, then you will find that this makes this back and forth oscillations. And then uh, you, you could verify it's the cosine function. So again, when this block makes back and forth motion, its position here, x in this graph is shown as the y-axis. And the time, you don't see time here, obviously here in this picture, and time here in the, in the, in the plot is shown as the x-axis. Okay, so, but why do we use cosine? Can we use sine? Yes, we can use sine. Both sine and cosine, they give uh, waves. So the difference between cosine and sine, we can see it from, from this plot. Again, we are plotting position versus time. So the blue one is cosine. We just did in the previous slide. The orange one is the same function, but uh, this the same amplitude, but we are using sine. Okay, let's compare them. So at time equals zero, 
So when I plug zero here and zero here, cosine zero is one. So it will give me a is four. So cosine zero is one. This is going to be one. So one times four, it will start from four, that makes sense. And now look at sine. If I plug here zero, then sine zero is zero. So it would start from zero, that makes sense. As time passes by and the cosine function goes down, it decreases, you can verify this if you want with your calculator, try 0 0.1 for time or 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you will see that those cosine values, they are decreasing. And if you try for sine values, you will see that they are actually increasing. So if, let's say, let's think about the harmonic oscillator again. Let's say it can go between uh, negative four and plus four. So if the function is cosine, that means the oscillator is starting from here initially at t equals zero. It's at four. And so this is the oscillator. So as time passes by, it will start moving this way. But for the sine, if at time equals zero, this function, the position, you know, sine zero is zero, so the position is zero. So at time equals zero, the block starts from the middle point, not negative four, not positive four, it starts from middle point. So this is again the oscillator. And as time passes by, so it goes to four. So it will move this way both will make the same motion with the same period. The period here is three. The amplitude is four. So they will both go back and forth between negative four and four. The only difference is one of them, the, the, the one with the sine, it starts from the zero point initially, but the one with the cosine, it starts from x equals four initially. So that's the only difference. Okay, now what about if I change, let's again use sine. So it's this case. So it's this case, it starts from zero, uh, zero point. As you can see, the green one starts from zero, but it doesn't go up to four. It goes only, so this point is one, this point is 0 0.5. So it only goes up to positive 0 0.5 and then negative 0 0.5. So it oscillates between 0 0.5 uh, plus and negative 0 0.5. Why is this happening? This because the amplitude, we set the amplitude here is to 0 0.5. So then if, so then we learn here, the amplitude, it determines the maximum and the minimum points, okay? So in this case, it's, it's moving between 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5. But in the, these two cases, these two cases, it's moving between four and negative four. So the amplitude determines the maximum and minimum points. And you can see that they, they, start, they start from zero. Let's think about again these two because the periods are the same, see, the period is three seconds. So for both of them, one full motion makes three seconds. Let's look at the orange one. Starts from here, goes up, down, and comes back to zero. Now look at this. It's between zero and three, so it takes zero seconds. So this is the period. Now also look at the green one. It again starts from here. Yes, the amplitude is small, but again, it makes for one full motion going up, down, back to zero, again, three seconds. What about the blue one? The blue one is, remember, it was for cosine. It starts from zero, at, at, uh, it starts at time equals zero, it starts from x equals four. So it goes down back uh, all the way to negative four and comes back to four. And if you measure this time, again, this is three seconds. And you can see from the formula, 
the period is set to three. You don't have to measure the period, the time that it takes for one full rotation from zero point. You can, you can, choose, you can measure it from any point. For example, you can choose between two minima. If you measure this distance, it's three seconds, or you can measure from, um, from any point. For example, you can measure from here. So it's kind of like, a, it's exactly at two to this point. So it goes down, up and back to down. So if you measure this time, the time that it takes from here to here, you will again find three seconds. So the bottom line here is sine or cosine, it determines the initial position of the block. The amplitude determines the maximum and minimum points. For the green one, it's is positive 0 0.5 and negative 0 0.5. And finally, the period determines the, the period of the, of, the, of the wave. We will see in the following slides that if you change period, you can get high frequency waves like this. Or if you have larger period, you would have waves which, with, uh, with larger periods like this. Okay, so the position becomes the same after period T. Well, if this is a periodic motion, that means the motion um, after one full motion, one cycle of motion, the object comes back to the initial position. Then if, for example, if this is the formula for the position, then this formula should be the same. The position at time equals T should be the same. The position should be the same at time T plus the period. So let's verify this. If I, in this formula, instead of T, if I plug T plus period, what happens? Let's see. So T plus period, distribute this to on both T and uh, period. So we get two pi divided by T uh, period times T. And in the second, for the second one, we have this term. So T, uh, the periods, they cancel out. So we get some number here or some uh, form with the variable t plus two pi. Now, if you have cosine, some angle plus two pi, if you remember from the trigonometry or this, is, this also means 360 degrees. Any, so uh, any time that you add 360 degrees to any angle, you will get again, if you calculate the cosine, it will be equal to cosine of that angle. So adding two pi to the angle for cosine or sine, it doesn't change anything. It gives back to you this term, so the first term. And if you compare these two, they are the same. So this proves that after time, after period, if uh, the amount of time that passes by is exactly the period, the object comes back to the initial position. And you can see it here, for example, if the object is here, if sometimes passes by, let's say this much, then the object comes here. Of course, it's not, you know, it's not coming back. It only comes back to the initial point when the time that passes by is exactly equal to period. Or you can, you can uh, look at this uh, bottom points. If you're here, then the object will be back to negative A. How much time and how much time? Well, after uh, the time period passes by. So this distance again is period. So let's make the connection between we talked about this before a little bit. There is a connection between the circular motion. You can see from this animation, the circular motion and the simple harmonic motion, they are related. 
So let's, let's talk about this connection a little bit more. So the motion of the shadow of an object. So let's say we have this object, this piece of wood maybe, and there's this light that's coming this way. So this piece, it will, it will uh, have some shadow on the screen here. So uh, here there's uh, three of them is shown, but there's only one. So when this piece is here, and the shadow is here, when this rotates, and this piece comes here, and then the shadow from here, it moves to the middle point. When uh, the disc rotates a little bit more, and this uh, wood piece comes here, then the shadow moves here. And of course, if the rotation continues, then the shadow, the movement of the shadow is basically back and forth, just like the harmonic oscillation of a block. So this is the connection between the circular motion and the linear harmonic oscillation, harmonic motion. You can also see it here. Think of this uh, blue dot as the, uh, the, the shadow of the red dot that goes around the center. And think of there's a, a light in this way. So this is the shadow. And you can see that there's a connection between the circular motion and the linear harmonic motion. So the motion of the shadow of an object in a uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion means the angular acceleration is zero. That means this, uh, this disc or record is rotating with certain uh, angular speed, which is constant. So it's not accelerating. That means it's uh, not speeding up or speeding down. So that's uh, angular acceleration is zero. So that's a uniform circular motion. So the shadow is, so uh, the motion of the shadow of an object in uniform circular motion is a simple harmonic motion, which is here. Think about the shadow. The shadow moves as if it's connected to, to a spring, similar to the motion of a mass connected to a spring. Now the angular speed here, omega, and it's related to two pi divided by period. If you want to remember these concepts, you can go back to the videos of chapter 10 and 11. Um, so the angular speed and angular frequency, they are actually the same thing, uh, two pi divided by period. You can also write one over, pe uh, one over period as frequency. So you can also write it as two pi frequency. So the position of the shadow on this axis, x-axis here, negative a, positive a, these are the amplitude, maximum and the minimum points. So that movement is, we can write it as a, the amplitude, times cosine omega t. Remember that this cosine, it's something between negative one cosine and positive one. So if you, when multiplied by a, the position is something between positive a and negative a. So again, we can rewrite omega, the angular frequency as two pi divided by t period, or we can also write omega as two pi f, which is frequency. These are all equivalent. So we established the connection between the circular motion and the simple harmonic motion. Now let's move to this slide to actually show how those uh, cosines uh, for the harmonic motion come or derive. So again, think about this circular motion. So the position of the shadow, again, this is the wood the piece of wood and there's this light and that light makes a shadow that moves between this point maximum, which is A and this point. So this shadow moves back and forth, okay? So how do you calculate the position then? Well, if this is the radius A, then if you want to calculate the, the X component of this radius or this object. So this object, its position is at A. 
And so this object moves like first here, here it makes a rotation. But if you wanna calculate its X position, so you basically find the X component of this radius vector. How do you find the X component? Well, you basically multiply the amplitude, which is A, times cosine of that angle. So this angle is the angle between the X axis and the vector. So if you, so if you wanna find the X component, you basically multiply the radius with cosine of that angle. So then we find this A cosine theta, it's basically the position, the X component of the position of this wood piece. And that corresponds to the position of the shadow, right? So this position, when the object, let's say, when this wood is here, the position is like this, the X component. When the wood is here, the, the X component is here. When it's here, well, the shadow will be somewhere here, then we actually don't have the, the it's gonna be zero. When it moves to here, then the X component of the position will be here and the shadow will be here. So this X component is actually giving us the formula for the shadow, right? So the position will be A times cosine theta. Now we also know that this theta is changing if this is rotating with angular frequency omega or angular speed omega, then this theta will be by definition, this goes back to chapter uh, 10. Uh, it becomes omega times T. So instead of theta, we are gonna write omega times T. And we actually find the formula for harmonic motion. Okay, so the shadow point here, the shadow of this wood piece here. So this thing is making uh, angular motion with angular speed omega, which is equal to angular frequency, same thing, two pi f. So the position of the shadow, we saw that it's amplitude, which is the maximum point here, times cosine omega t. The velocity in simple harmonic motion can be found from the tangential velocity formula, which is r times omega. So if you wanna find the tangential velocity of this root here. So, so here we wanna find the velocity of this shadow, but first let's think about the velocity of tangential velocity of this wood piece. So it's this velocity and its amplitude or the magnitude will be R. R is the radius. In this case, the radius is A times omega. Omega is the angular speed of this rotation of this disc. So this is the, so this is the speed of this wood piece. But what we want to find is its X component. So what is the X component of the velocity? Well, if, if you look at the geometry, if this is theta, now look at the Z here, then this should be also theta. And if this is theta, and you can see that this is 90 degrees. So this angle then will be 90 minus theta. And this angle would be theta. Or if you want, this would be also theta. Now, if this is theta, then if you want to find, let's do it again. So this is theta. So these are all the same angle. So if the vector is r times omega, this is the tangential velocity, and you wanna find the x component of velocity, then you have to multiply it by sine. So the x component will be v, which is r times omega times sine theta. Why do we have a negative sign? Because it points in the negative direction. So this also shows us, so this vector will show us the, the, the speed of the shadow, right? Because it's, it's always in the x, x direction. So of course, at this point, it's to the left, but at other points, for example, when this wood piece is here, 
So the velocity, tangential velocity is this way, and its x component will be in this way. Let me call it vx. So this vx here will be the speed of the shadow when the shadow is at this point. So it will have some speed and we can find that speed from r omega sine theta and theta is omega t. So here the shadow, the speed of the shadow would be negative a and it negative comes from the geometry again, uh, omega. So the, these two terms, a omega is actually the definition of the tangential velocity. You can go back to chapter 10 for to, uh, to remind it uh, yourself. And sine again comes from the geometry. So this is the, this is the speed of the shadow. If we plot the position and the speed together on the same graph, then you can see that when, let's say, when the shadow is at this point, so it's the maximum point, when the position is at maximum, so let's say this point, the speed, the x component of the speed is zero. You can look at actually this animation, the blue dot, it looks like it stops momentarily at these points. And it actually has the maximum point at the middle point. So momentarily at these points, it's zero, the speed is zero. Why should it be zero? Because if it's not zero, you cannot go back, right? To be able to go back, change the direction of the speed, it should stop momentarily. So it stops when the position at maximum, positive A, so the velocity is zero. It also stops when the position is at negative A. So this is negative A, it, the, the velocity is zero. Now, when is velocity maximum? The velocity is maximum when x is zero. That means when the object is at the middle point. So at the middle point, the velocity becomes maximum. Okay, now let's talk about acceleration. What is the acceleration of the shadow? The reason that we are dealing with shadow here is actually we want to, uh, we want to find we know the position, the position is for the harmonic oscillator, a times cosine omega t. But we want to, what we want to find is uh, the velocity, the formula for velocity and the formula for acceleration of this block when it undergoes simple harmonic motion. To be able to do that, we know that the simple harmonic motion is equivalent to angular motion. So that's why we are using here the angular motion to find the formula for, uh, for the simple harmonic motion for position, velocity, and acceleration. So we already did it position and uh, the velocity. Now we will do, uh, we will try to find the acceleration of the shadow, which will be the acceleration of this block under simple harmonic motion. So in uniform circular motion, which means there's no circular acceleration, and the angular speed is some constant, okay? So there's no tangential acceleration. In this case, there will be no, so tangential acceleration means there will be an acceleration in this direction. If this was accelerating, like uh, this, if the speed, angular speed was increasing, but because it's, it's the angular speed is zero, in this case, there's no tangential acceleration. The only acceleration in this case will be the centripetal acceleration, and it's always towards the center. Now this, these concepts go back to chapter six and 10. So there's always an acceleration towards the center in any circular motion, even if there's no acceleration. Because if you think about this object, this, this piece of wood, let's say, uh, Let's consider only this object. So if there is no acceleration, its initial velocity is like this, it would want to go straight, right? So there's always a the change. So the velocity, even though the magnitude is not changing, it's the same speed, but the direction is changing. So that means velocity is changing. When velocity is changing, then there should be 
some acceleration, centripetal acceleration, and it's towards the center. Now, what is the formula for centripetal acceleration? It's omega squared r. So this is the formula. So for the shadow, the acceleration of the shadow, then will be the centripetal acceleration. Remember, there's no ex tangential acceleration in this case because we are considering uniform circular motion. Only uniform circular motion is equivalent to simple harmonic motion. If there is acceleration, then that's not equivalent to simple harmonic motion. Okay, so then the centripetal acceleration, we will write omega squared r. So if we look at the geometry here, the centripetal acceleration is towards the center. We are interested in the X component of the acceleration because we want to find the acceleration of the shadow. So if you want to calculate, so if this is theta, then this angle is also theta. To calculate the X component of the acceleration, you have to do A times cosine theta. Of course, you have to add a negative sign because as you can see, it points in the negative direction. So the acceleration is the centripetal acceleration. This is centripetal acceleration, ACP. There's a negative sign from the geometry times cosine theta. And ACP is omega squared times R. So it's here. And you have the cosine term. So R is the radius. In this case, it's A. And instead of theta, I'm writing omega times t. So in any, again, angular motion, theta depends on time as angular speed times t. So then we find the, the acceleration of the shadow or acceleration in simple harmonic motion as negative a omega squared, the angular frequency squared cosine omega t. And you can also notice that the, the shadow's acceleration is in the same direction as the rest, restoring force, F equals Kx, of the spring. So if you imagine um, a spring, let's say a block that goes back and forth here. So instead of a block, we can think of this shadow and imagine it's connected to a spring. So when the shadow is here, it's the acceleration is to the left, as you can see here. And that's indeed, if this is the zero point, so this is the equilibrium point, x equals zero. So acceleration is to the left. And it makes sense because when the object is here while doing harmonic motion, the force, the restoring force will be, remember, towards the center, towards the equilibrium point. So the acceleration, that's what it says here. The acceleration is in the same direction as the restoring force. And it makes sense because we know f from f equals ma, the direction of the acceleration is in the same direction as the direction of the force. Of course, in this, in this rotational motion, there's no force, but we know that it's equivalent to simple harmonic motion. So in the simple harmonic motion, the force is the restoring spring force. Okay, in this example, we have an air track. So basically there is, um, on this air track, there's air between this, this block and this uh, track so that there's no friction. So it makes a perfect simple harmonic motion. So an air track cart, cart is this uh, block, completes one oscillation in every 2.4 seconds. So that means it goes to this point, the minimum point, and comes back to the maximum point in position, and it takes 2.4 seconds. So this is the period. At equals t, at equals zero, the spring is stretched 0 0.1 meters. So if this is equilibrium point, then the maximum point is 0 0.1 meters. And it's released. So it's released from this point. 
what are the velocity and acceleration of the car at t equals 0 0.3 seconds? So first we have to calculate omega, right? Because in the formulas, if you remember, we always need omega, the angular frequency. So how do you calculate it? It's basically two pi divided by period. So two pi divided by 2.4 and you find 2.6 radians per second. Now the second is coming from the denominator because there's this period, it's in, term, uh, in units of second. And here two pi, remember pi, two pi, it's um, if you write it as 360 degrees, it's in degrees, but if you write it as two pi, it's in radians. So angles in, in, in units of pi, in, in terms of pi, it's in uh, radians. So we have the angular frequency in terms of radians per second. Now we can use the formulas that we derived in the previous slides. So for velocity, it's negative a omega sine omega t, and for the acceleration, it's negative a omega squared. Now look at the difference, there's two here. And the other difference is we have sine here, we have cosine here. And probably you have noticed if you have taken calculus, you can actually get to a by taking the derivative of v with respect to omega. If you take the derivative of, sorry, with respect to t, with respect to time, if you take the derivative of this term, v with respect to time, you get a, uh, extra omega term that comes out, which is here. And you take the derivative of sine, you get cosine. So that's just an extra, extra uh, information. Now, getting back to the calculation, the amplitude is, which is the maximum stretch, maximum position is 0 0.1. The negative sign is coming from the formula. Omega is the angular frequency, 2.6. And then you write the sine and cosine terms. And then this is again omega. And you multiply it by time because here it says 0 0.3 seconds after. And you can calculate now the, uh, the speed and the acceleration by making these calculations. The caution here is that make sure you use radians per second, which we did here for the frequency for omega. Uh, not degrees per second, or so not revs per minute. If you want to find everything in SI units, which is for length, it's meters, for time, it's seconds. And um, in the case of you have mass, it's in kilograms. Okay, here's another example. So there's this airplane uh, because of some uh, certain factors, maybe turbulence, it goes up and down. It makes some harmonic motion like this. So data from the airplanes black box indicated that the airplane moved up and down with an amplitude of 30 meters. So that means this maximum, it goes up 30 meters and goes down for another 30 meters. And it had a maximum acceleration of 1.8 G, okay? That's uh, more than acceleration of Earth. Acceleration of Earth is G, which is 9.8, 9.8 meter per second squared. So this is actually more than almost twice as large as Earth's gravity. So in treating the up and down motion of the plane as simple harmonic motion, well, there's no spring, you know, connected, but you know, if it makes this motion, you can treat this motion approximately as a simple harmonic motion. That means you can use the formula for simple harmonic motion. So first find uh, the time required for one complete oscillation. That means let's say from here for one oscillation from here. So how much time, how much time passes? That's the period. And in the second part, the plane's maximum vertical speed. Okay, let's start with the first one. So the first one is asking what the period is. Now, we can use the acceleration for that um, to find the period. First of all, it says the maximum acceleration is 1.8 G. So this is the acceleration. 
the maximum happens when this cosine terms is one, right? We don't know what time at what t that happens, but if you want the maximum, it's the maximum that a cosine can give you is one. So then the maximum of acceleration, its magnitude, let's not worry about the negative sign, it will be a times omega squared. And in the problem, it's, it says it's 1.8 G. So we are gonna go from here. So the amplitude is 30 meters, okay? And uh, omega is two pi divided by period. That's just the definition. And there's a square here. And that's equal to 1.8 G. Now the question is, so we have the equation. The question is, by the way, we already know what G is, numerical value. Now, the only thing that you have to do at this point is solve this equation for T period. And if you do the calculation, you find the period is 8.2 seconds. So for the plane to make one full motion up and down, it takes 8.2 seconds. If you want from this point, you can also find um, omega as well. So omega is two pi divided by period. So if you do two pi divided by 8.2, you can also find, you can calculate uh, angular frequency if you want. Now in the second part, the planes, it asks what the plane's maximum vertical speed is. So the speed formula is this. The maximum is, well, what should be, what, what could sine give me as the maximum value? Well, it's a trigonometric function. Both cosine and sine, they can give me whatever inside. I don't know at what time it's gonna give me the maximum, but it will give me one as the maximum. So anything other than you know one, it will be less than one. So then the maximum of the speed is A times omega. Remember the maximum of acceleration is A times omega squared, but the maximum of the speed is A times omega. So A was 30 and omega is two pi divided by 8.2. Remember this was T and the definition of omega is two pi divided by T period. And the calculation, the end of the calculation, you find the maximum velocity is 23 meter per second. Now, at which point does this, does the velocity becomes maximum? If you remember the harmonic motion, so this is like going up and down. If you remember at the top point and at the middle point, the velocity becomes zero. Well, it has to become zero because here the velocity is in the up direction. After this point, it's gonna be down direction. If you wanna change direction, then you have to stop first at some point. So here it's gonna be zero. If you remember, the velocity becomes maximum at the middle point. So this point is like the middle point, equilibrium point for the harmonic motion. So this is like, uh, so a, uh, an object going up and down, harmony, uh, undergoing simple harmonic motion. So here the speed is down and here it becomes maximum. Or at this point it goes up, here it's also maximum. So the speed becomes maximum at the equilibrium point. Okay, let's move to um, the period of a mass on a spring. For a spring mass system of its spring constant, or it's also called force constant K and mass M. So we have this system. The spring constant, again, it tells us uh, how stiff or how soft the spring is. It depends on the material that it's made of or the shape of it or the length of it. So if you have this system, then uh, of course this is gonna do up and down motion, the oscillation. Now the angular frequency will be, uh, 
is square root k, the spring constant, divided by m. Or if you take the square of both sides and uh, put the m term to the other side, you can also write it as k equals m times omega squared. And if you remember, the period was one over f, and f is omega divided by two pi. Of course, you have the inverted here. So the period is two pi divided by angular uh, frequency. And angular frequency is here, we define for the spring mass system, it's this one. So if you write this thing in the denominator here, and of course, flip it, then you get the period of the mass and spring system is two pi square root m divided by k. And this is this is valid also for for harmonic oscillators on on the plane like this. So it doesn't have to be vertical; it could be horizontal. In both cases, the period is given by this formula. And if you notice that the period is independent of the amplitude A, which is how much it's stretched initially. So you can stretch it just a little bit. So let's say this is the uh, equilibrium point. You can stretch it just a little bit to this point and it will make this harmonic motion between these points, right? So this is X equals zero, the equilibrium, it will make this motion. So the period of this motion, so going up, and going down back to the initial, uh, the, the uh, lowest point will be period T, which is given by this. If you pull it more, let's say you pull it more up down to here. Again, this is the equilibrium point. Now it will go down, down here, up here. Now you may think that it, the period will be more, but it's not. It's again, this up down motion. The period will again, Bt. And if you look at the formula again, the period depends on only k and m. It doesn't depend on the initial stretch. So it doesn't depend on the amplitude. Here amplitude is less. Let's call it a1. Here amplitude is more, but the period is the same. Then you can ask, okay, how is it possible for the period is the same to be the same if, the, if it has to go up and down more distance. Well, in this case, what's different is, for example, the speed is different. So it moves quicker in this case so that it can cover more distance at the same period. But again, the period is independent of the amplitude. It only depends on K and M. Now this slide shows you how things change and how the function changes, uh, how the shape of the function changes. If we change, for example, the amplitude, the angular frequency or the period and uh, so in other variables, for example, if you change, if you increase force constant K or the spring constant by a factor of four, let's see what happens if I, increase k by a factor of four, it's in the square root two. So it will, that four will come out as two. So that means the angular speed or the angular frequency will be doubled. So if this is the original, then what's gonna happen is this omega will be doubled. So that's, that means the frequency is increased by a factor of two. Now the frequency is, if you remember, how many times this oscillates back and forth in one second. Let's say one second is, let's say the whole thing is one second from here to zero. So this oscillates one, two, two and a half. If I double the frequency, then in one second, the same, let's say this is one second. So it should, it should oscillate five times, right here it would oscillate one, two, two and a half. So here, one, two, three, four, and five times. And you can see that if you see anything like, like this, that means high frequency. If you see anything like this, that means low frequency. 
So low frequency, that corresponds to higher period. See the period for one full motion, the time that it takes is higher. If the frequency is high, so high frequency, then the period, look at it, it's, it's smaller. The period is smaller, smaller, smaller period. Okay, so in this case here, in uh, case B, increase mass by a factor of four. Now, if you increase mass by a factor of four, that means we're gonna have four here, but that will come out as one over two here, right? So that means the, the frequency is halved. So it's now twice as small as the initial frequency. So in the original case, it was making two 0.5 full motions. And if you decrease the frequency by two, by uh, increasing the mass by a factor of four, then you get one full motion and a little bit more, but not two. So you can see that the frequency, so how many times that oscillation happens in a given time is decreased. And that makes sense because if you have if you have a heavier mass now then that back and forth motion so if you think about force equals m times a now if you have a heavier mass for a given for the same spring force the acceleration will be low smaller then that back and forth motion will take more time because the acceleration is smaller here, the force constant was uh, larger by a factor of four. That means your the, the spring is stiffer, so you can apply more force, F equals MA. So for the same mass, if the K is larger, that, that means it can, it can pull stronger, then force is more, acceleration is more. When the acceleration is more than this, uh, the, the object can make uh, quicker back and forth oscillations. Okay, in the case of C, increase force constant K and mass by a factor of four. That's easy. If you increase K and M both by a factor of four, so four, four, those fours will cancel out. So nothing will change. So the frequency will be the same. That's why we have the same shape here. Okay, finally, in the case of D, increase the amplitude by a factor of two. So we just increase this amplitude by a factor of two. What happens, the, the frequency will not change or the period will not change. So in this given time, if it makes two, two and a half motions, and in this case, after changing the amplitude, it will again make two and a half motions. So the, so the frequency or the period doesn't change, but the only thing that changes is when you change the amplitude, the maximum point and the minimum point is changing. So if it's going between, let's say one and two here, sorry, one and negative one, here, if you double A by a factor of, so if you increase it by a factor of two, then this time it will go between positive two and negative two. Okay, let's look at this example. A 0 0.26 kilogram mass is attached to a vertical spring. So here's the mass. When the mass is put into motion, its period is 1.12 seconds. So this is the T, the period, uh, period of up and down motion. In part A, how much does the mass stretch the spring when it's at rest in its equilibrium position? So the question is, 
the equilibrium position was here, when you add a mass here, it's stretched down here. So uh, think about any oscillations yet, it's just stretched. And um, now this is the new equilibrium point, negative y0. The question is, what is that distance? What is that y0? So let's start with this formula. The, it, it relates to period, mass, and the spring constant of the system. Now, I want to use this formula because I want to find k, because k is spring constant is not given in the problem. Period is given. This t is given. Uh, mass is given here. So remember, we have to use kilograms. We are using SI units. And if I use this formula, I can find what k is. So if you can take the square of both sides and then solve for k and plug in the numbers. So this is the period, this is the mass. And it turns out that the spring constant is 8.18 Newton, Newtons per meter. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I want to relate the force in the up direction, which is coming from the spring. Remember the spring force is F equals KX. You can write the negative sign or not if it's, it's fine. Um, so this block is in equilibrium, right? So I have to write down the forces on it. The upward force is coming from the spring. It's pulling, it, pulling the block up with the force K times Y0. Remember this was the equilibrium. And if it's stretched for the distance y0, then the force will be k times y0. Again, k is the spring constant that we just calculated here. Now, the that force is balanced by the weight. Weight is mg. So if I equate these, then I can find, I can solve for y0. So I equate the up force to up force to downward force. And if you solve for y0, you will find it to be 0 0.312 meters. Now in the second part, it says, suppose this experiment is repeated on a planet where the acceleration due to gravity is twice what is on Earth. So on the Earth, it's approximately G equals uh, 9.8, you can take it 10. But if you make this experiment where G is 20, then what happens? So the question is by what multiplicative factors do the period and equilibrium stretch change? Now let's consider first the period. This is the formula for the period. What happens if G becomes 2G? So we go to the we go to a planet where it's so massive, it's mass more massive than the Earth, its gravity. In the, the acceleration of gravity is 2g. Well, if you look at the formula, there's no place for g, right? So the period, it wouldn't change. Okay, but what about the, this value of y0? The value of y0, it would double. The reason is now we have to look at here, this equation, because we found the value of y0. Um, from this equation. So if G doubles, now this is a linear equation, if G doubles, then Y0 would double. Again, here Y0 is not the oscillation amplitude. It's just if the spring was like this in equilibrium with no mass, if so you add a mass, it goes down here and stays here. So it's not os oscillating. Um, in principle, it can oscillate between any amplitude. So it depends on how much you stretch it down. But this is this point, Y0 is just a new equilibrium if you want. So at this point, it's not oscillating. It's just staying like this. So um, we use this point to find Y0 from the relation between the uh, balance of forces. Okay, let's move to energy. Now energy of these, so these oscillations, while this is going back and forth, 
there's definitely some velocity. Of course, at the maximum and the minimum point, it becomes zero. And there's also from the spring, there's also potential energy. So the total energy of the system will be the kinetic energy from the speed of the block and plus the potential energy from, from the spring, uh, spring potential energy. So what is the kinetic energy? It's one half mv squared and m is the mass of the block. What is the potential energy stored in the spring? It's one half kx squared that we learned in the earlier chapters. Now, if energy is conserved, well, energy should be conserved here uh, if we ignore uh, the air resistance and the friction that we do, we do ignore them. So the energy should be conserved. So this expression, it should be conserved. So it's a constant number. Now, we calculated, we derived the velocity for harmonic motion could be expressed in this form and the position in this form. And we also learned the relation between the frequency, the angular frequency and the spring constant and the mass, it was this relation. So if we plug in these, uh, uh, these forms into this uh, energy definition, so what we get is for the kinetic energy, so it's one half m, so instead of V, we're gonna write this thing squared. So instead of V squared, we're gonna write, so A squared, amplitude squared, uh, angular frequency squared, sine squared. And it's going to be um, one half. So these terms, so these two terms, they give you K, if you look at here, K equals M times omega squared. So m times omega squared is just k. So we get one half k a squared times sine squared omega t. For the potential energy, it's one half k x squared. Instead of x, we're gonna write, uh, instead of x squared, we're gonna write a squared cosine squared. Now, finally, we're gonna add these up. So kinetic pl plus potential. So just add these two terms. Now what's common here is one half K. So, and also A squared, these are common. So let's use the parentheses. So sine squared plus cosine squared. Now, whenever you have sine squared and cosine squared, doesn't matter what the argument is. If the argument is of these two functions is the same, then this is always one. That's something that we learned from, from trigonometry. So what's left is just this term. So the total energy then is always one half K A squared. So if you look at here, now this is the total energy, okay? And its value is one half K A squared. At different points, this total energy, some part of it could be kinetic and some part of it could be potential. For example, at the maximum point, it will be purely potential, right? Because if you remember at the maximum point, the velocity was at right at this moment, at that point, velocity is zero. If velocity is zero, kinetic energy is zero. Remember this term will be zero. So all the energy would be just potential energy here. At the middle point, if you remember, the velocity was maximum and the potential becomes zero because the spring at, when x equals zero, the spring is neither compressed nor stretched. So there's no potential energy because see, potential energy depends on the compression or uh, extension. So then at this point, all of the energy would be kinetic. So the point here is the total energy is constant, which is one half K A squared, but this total energy may be uh, shared as some part of it as kinetic energy and some part of it potential energy. So sometimes it becomes purely kinetic at the middle point. Sometimes that kinetic energy at the, at the uh, maximum and the minimum points, 
that kinetic energy completely turns into potential energy. And in between these points, the total energy becomes a combination of kinetic and potential, but the total kinetic energy doesn't change. The total is always this point, this level, one half K A squared. So we found that the total energy is time independent as it should be because we ignored friction and A resistance. So the, the total energy is conserved. Okay, so let's look at this situation here. How far is the spring compressed? So this block comes with some initial velocity. It hits the spring and uh, compresses the spring to the maximum uh, val uh, point. And at that point, the block's speed becomes zero. Of course, if you wait a little bit, you know, in the next frames, it will, now the spring will start pushing it and then the block will go out with the same speed. But let's stop here. Let's stop at the point where the spring is maximally compressed and the block stopped completely. So the question here is how far is the spring compressed before the block comes to rest? So what is that maximum value for A? We know that the spring potential energy is one half K X squared. So here energy is conserved. There's no reason why energy wouldn't conserve because there's no inelastic collision. It's just the kinetic energy is turned into potential energy. And that potential energy on the spring will turn into kinetic energy again to the, uh, as the kinetic energy of the box. If you, uh, you know, continue uh, in, in the next frames. So it will, the box will come out with the same initial speed. But let's stop here for this to make, apply the, the energy conservation to these two situations. So this is the initial, we're gonna call this initial and this we're gonna call this final. So the initial energy and final energy should be the same. Initially, so energy is kinetic and potential in each case. Initial kinetic energy is the kinetic energy of the box. And initially, because the spring is neither stretched nor compressed, there's no potential energy on the spring. In this final position, the kinetic energy of the box is zero. We never talk about kinetic energy of the spring because it doesn't have any kinetic energy. We, we assume the springs are massless. And the potential energy of the spring, now it's compressed for A, one half, the potential energy becomes one half K A squared. Do we talk about the, um, the potential energy of, of the block? No, we don't because it moves on the same level. Blocks height doesn't change. So we don't talk about the potential energy of the, of the block. Now, so what we get from here is one half MB zero squared is equal to one half K A squared. So from here, you can solve for A and you can find the maximum compression A for a given initial speed. Here is another situation where let's say you have, uh, you, wanna, you wanna, let's say measure this, the, the speed of a bullet. So traditionally you could use some setup like this. So the bullet comes in and sticks into the block. And because of it has some, uh, it will, so the system, the block and the bullet, it will have some speed. So, and it will uh, compress the spring. So by measuring the compression amount, you can relate it to, you can actually find the initial speed of the bullet. So a bullet of mass M and speed V0 sticks into the block. What is the maximum compression of the spring? So basically it says relate the initial velocity, initial speed of the bullet to the maximum compression of the spring. Now we have to divide this problem into two. The first part is the collision of the bullet with the block. It's an inelastic collision. 
So we cannot really talk about energy conservation because the bullet will deform the block. It will create some heat, some sound. So the energy, so some energy is lost into heat, deformation, and sound. So we cannot really talk about energy conservation. It's not conserved, but the momentum is always conserved. So if you remember from earlier chapters, in collisions, whether it's uh, elastic collision or inelastic collision, momentum is always conserved. But energy is not conserved in inelastic collision. So we will use momentum conservation. So the initial momentum, the total momentum, will be equal to final total momentum. Initially, the bullet has momentum mv0. Remember, the momentum formula is m times the speed, the velocity. And the block, the block initially has no momentum because it doesn't have any speed. So the finally, they come together. It's an inelastic collision. They become one object, and its mass is m, a lowercase m plus uppercase m. And times, we will call the speed after the emerging of the bullet and the box, that speed, we will call it V. Okay, so if you solve for V here, it will be M V zero divided by lowercase m plus uppercase m. So this is the speed right after the collision. Now we can move to the second part of uh, the problem. Now in the second part, we have, uh, we have the mass, uh, we have the block and the bullet now as uh, one object and it starts, so they start compressing the spring. So now after that point, there's really no, uh, there's no energy loss. It's just compressing the spring. So the energy is conserved. There's no inelastic collision anymore. So after this point, then we can use the energy conservation. The initial energy is, if you remember, so the block and the bullet, they had speed V. So their kinetic energy, and you can look at here, I'm writing the kinetic energy for the block and the bullet system together. And their speed is V. Initially, there's no compression in the spring, so the potential spring potential energy is zero. And finally, the kinetic energy becomes zero because here we look at the point where the block stops. Of course, again, if you wait any uh, uh, small amount of time, now the spring will, uh, because the spring is pushing the block in the opposite direction, of course, the block will come out with that speed V. But let's make the calculations with respect to this time where the black momentarily stops. And that's actually the maximum compression when the, uh, that time is the, the moment when the maximum compression happens. And for a compression of distance A, the spring potential energy is one half K A squared. Okay, now that V, it was the speed after the bullet and the block merged together. So I calculated it here. Now I can plug it here, which is this term. Okay, so we have one half m plus m, that's from the kinetic energy. And this term is the speed squared. And that's equal to one half k a squared, spring potential energy. Now, if you want to determine, let's say, the, uh, the bullet speed here, the speed of the bullet. Now, you have to know the bullet mass, which you can measure, you can weigh it. You have to know the mass of the block, which you can again uh, measure. Uh, you have to know K, the spring constant. That's, uh, that's also easy to measure. And you have to also measure the distance of the compression, which you can also do easily. So by knowing these quantities, you can actually determine the speed of the bullet.
Now we move to pendulum. A simple pendulum consists of a point like mass like this, suspended by a massless string or rod of length L. So you think of a mass concentrated at this point and the thing that it holds it, or it could be a rod or spring, string, we, we uh, consider it massless. So that's called simple pendulum. In the following slides, we will see physical pendulum. In that case, this part that holds the mass would be uh, massive. But in this case, if we are talking about just simple pendulum, we, the only thing that's massive here is this mass concentrated at the end. So the period for this one, it looks like the period of the harmonic oscillator where we had M and K, but in this case, instead of M and K, we have the length of the pendulum divided by uh, G, which is the gravity of the earth. So this is the period for a pendulum. So G and L, they determine the period of one full swing. As you can see, it doesn't depend on M in this case, but it depends on G. So if you go to the moon or any different, any other planet, because G will be different for the same L, for the same length of uh, rod or string, the pendulum will swing with different period just because G will be different on the moon or on any other planet. Okay, let's read this exercise. The pendulum in a grandfather clock, there's a pendulum here, this makes a swing back and forth, uh, is designed to take one second to swing in each direction. So if it starts from here, so make a swing from right to left. So this takes one second, but the period is one full swing, right? Going forward, and backward, so then period is two seconds. So that's two seconds for a complete period. Find the length of the pendulum that has a period of two seconds. So this is the formula that we saw in the previous slide. So if you want, so you know T, it's two seconds. You know G, 9.8. And from here, you can solve for L which gives you G uh, period squared divided by four pi squared. If you plug in the numbers, you will find for, uh, for a grandfather clock, uh, for its uh, pendulum to have a period of two seconds, you need to have, you need to use this length, you need to have this length to be 0 0.994 meters. Okay, now let's move to physical pendulum. Physical pendulum is a solid extended mass. Remember in the, uh, in the simple pendulum, so this one, in the simple pendulum, we had a string or rod, which is massless, and a massive point here concentrated at the tip. So this was the simple pendulum. And, but the physical pendulum is a solid extended mass. So it's not like this. Here in the simple, simple pendulum, the mass was a point like concentrated at one point, but in the physical pendulum like this, or like this rod or this bone, um, the mass is extended. It's not concentrated at one point. So that oscillates around its center of mass but cannot be modeled as a point mass suspended by a massless string. So we cannot really model these as a simple pendulum. So these are physical pendulums. Now the period for the physical pendulum is similar to the symbol pendulum, but there's a difference. This, you can see the difference is the second term. The simple pendulum was only this part. So in the physical pendulum, we got this second part as multiplied with the rest. So here L 
this curly L is the distance from the pivot point. Pivot point is the, uh, the axis of rotation. In this case, it's this point. Uh, so curly L is the distance from the pivot point to the center of mass. Center of mass for, for these objects, it's in the middle. Let's assume these are homogeneous. So the center of mass will be in the middle. Of course, if it's a inhomogeneous object or a, uh, or a shape that's uh, not regular, then um, you have to know where the center of mass. So from the axis of rotation or pivot point to the center of mass, that's, that's the curly L. And the other thing that you can see here is the moment of inertia. If you don't know what it is, you have to go back to chapter 10. If you forgot, you can remind yourself what it was. It's, it's kind of like mass, but it comes in the formulas where the rotation happens. So if the moment of inertia is large, that means it's harder to rotate the object. So if you have a rod and it, if it's rotated around its middle point, then the moment of inertia is one half, a one twelfth m L squared, m, m is the mass of the rod, L is the total length of the rod. But if you rotate it around its end, then the moment of inertia is one third m l squared. Again, L is the whole distance, uh, whole length of the rod. So for this bone, I can model it as a rod where the, uh, in this case, the, I would use for the moment of inertia because it's, it's rotated around this period point. So I would use for the moment of inertia, I would use one over three times m l squared. So imagine, so I assume the whole distance is l. And in this case, the curly l becomes l divided by two. Here I assumed this is a homogeneous rod and the center of mass is at the middle point. In fact, we have an example in the next slide. So it asks calculate the period of human step. So what is the period of human step? So moment of inertia of a rod of length so for the leg, I'm going to model it as a rod of approximately one meter. And it's the pivot point is at the top, not in the middle because uh, the leg is connected to uh, this part, the hip. So the moment of inertia, I'm not going to use one divided by 12, but I'm going to use one divided by three because it's the pivot point is at the end. So M is the, in this case, it's going to be the mass of the leg and L will be again, the mass of the leg, which is approximately one meter. So this is going to be the moment of inertia. The center of mass is for a leg is approximately, not exactly, but approximately at the center. So for lowercase L or this curly L, we are gonna use one half L, which is in this case, L is one. So this is L. So this is going to be 0 0.5. So if we apply the formula that we saw in the previous slide, so the curly L is half of the leg. Why? Because the center of mass is in the middle, approximately. And the curly L was by definition, it was the distance between the pivot point and the center of mass point which is L divided by two in this case, G is here. Now the moment of inertia I is one divided by three M L squared. M is here again, curly L is L divided by two, but here from the formula, there's a uh, square. You have to take the square. And if you calculate this period from here, now uh, if you do some cancellations like these, this is gone, this one is gone. Um, you end up with this shape, uh, with this form. And if you calculate, plug in the numbers, you will find 
the period is 1.6 seconds. So this number, 1.6 seconds, is basically, uh, let's, let's think about this as, as the left, left uh, leg. So the left leg goes forward and goes back to the original position while walking. So that's, that's period. So it goes forward and then goes back for while walking. So that's 1.6 seconds. The other thing that you can notice from this expression, even though we use M in the formula, but they canceled out. So the final formula had no M in it. So the period turns out is independent of M. So approximately, of course, we are making some approximations here, but in this case, it turns out that the, the, the period will be independent of mass of the leg. In this part of the problem, we will calculate the approximate human linear speed. So we calculated the period of this motion, the, the motion of the leg, but what is the linear speed of the person walking? So first we have to find this arc length, okay? Uh, it's basically the, the length so the, the length that the foot sweeps, and it's approximately, we will take it to be one radiant. One radiant is approximately 55, 56 degrees, approximately. So if you wanna calculate this distance, the arc length S, we're gonna call it S, the formula is radius, times theta, but this theta, this angle should be in radians. So in this case, one meter times one radians, it's one meters. Okay, this distance is one meters. So it's an arc, but we can assume, we can approximate it. We can approximately say that distance if you think about this linear distance, it's approximately also one meters. So, and we know that the period was 1.6 seconds. So this is the time. So this was the time for the left leg to go forward and come back to the uh, initial position. So go back, go back to the initial position. So that was the period, but for one step, it should be half of this time, right? So one step is defined as, let's say left leg goes to forward. And that's half of the period. So then we can say one step takes 0 0.8 seconds, basically half of the period. Now, if you wanna calculate the linear speed, then you will do V equals distance divided by time. Uh, of course, we are Calculating approximately, we made a couple of approximations. So we will assume that the distance is one meter here. And we will also say uh, that the, the step, the one step, which is half of the period is 0 0.8 seconds. If you, and if you do the division, you will find the linear speed is 1.3 meter per second. Okay, let's also calculate the uh, period of this hula hoop. So this hula hoop of which mass is given here and the radius is also given. So it's, it hangs from a peg, the peg is here in a garage. When someone bumps the hoop, it begins to swing back and forth. So it begins to swing back and forth. Now the question is, what is the hoop's period of oscillation? So what is T? We learned that for physical pendulums, I mean, this is not a simple pendulum. This is a physical pendulum because simple pendulum is something like this. There's this string and a mass concentrated at some point. But if you look at here, mass is distributed along the hula hoop. So it's not concentrated like in the simple pendulum. Remember, this was simple pendulum. This is physical 
physical in the sense that it's more realistic pendulum. So for physical pendulum, this was the formula. So for curly L, remember, it was the distance between the pivot point and the center of mass. Well, if you have a hoop like this homogeneous, the center of mass will be in the middle. So CM is here. Then the distance between the pivot point, this is pivot point, and the center of mass is basically radius R. So curly L will be R. Uh, the other thing that we need is the moment of inertia. It's given in the problem, moment of inertia for the hoop is two M R squared. M is the mass of this hoop. So you plug in this expression here. And after that point, you can make the calculations. You can, of course, before that, you can make some uh, cancellations. And you make the calculations and you find the period is two seconds. Okay, now we move to damp oscillations. If the oscillating system loses energy, now look at the black one. It doesn't lose energy, right? It goes up and down and it doesn't, the amplitude doesn't go down. It's not damped. Damping means the energy goes down. But if you look at the blue one, it starts with high amplitude and the amplitude goes down. It loses energy. And this happens usually if um, because of the air resistance or, um, or it could have other reasons. And now look at the position versus time graph. The black is always going between positive two and negative two. So there's no energy loss for the black one. But if you look at the blue one, the amplitude starts just like the black one from two, but the amplitude goes down as you can see. So that's damping. So that's the effect of damping. If the oscillating system loses energy, which the blue one does, its amplitude decreases in time. So if the system is losing energy, then it's, it's not the period, not the frequency. What's changing? It's the amplitude. The amplitude is changing. Now look at the period. The period doesn't change. Look at the blue one. It crosses zero, uh, x equals zero, exactly at the same time, just like the black one. The period, if you want, so it's maximum here, the next point that it becomes maximum here, but that's also the same time where the black one becomes maximum. So that period T, and you can also measure it, for example, from here maximum and another maximum is maybe here. See the period is the same, even though it's losing energy, it's period is not changing. Or in other words, period is one over frequency. It's frequency is not changing. What's changing is its amplitude. So that's what's, what's set here. In other words, the motion, so that, you know, decrease of energy means the motion gets damped. So the amplitude here, it decreases with time. Now, for the black one, amplitude is always two. So this A0 is two. But for the blue one, it depends on time. The amplitude decreases with time. So there's this exponential function. When you have, if you want to plot this function, exponential, negative t, and maybe some numbers, if you plot it with respect to time, it's this decreasing function. And if you look at, the, there's some kind of envelope here. If you look at around, if you plot it around the blue, maximums of the blue. So that envelope is this exponential. And it depends on B, which is the damping constant. If the damping is more, so let's put B here. If the damping is more, it goes to zero really quickly. If B, the damping constant is less, it's a smaller number, 
then it takes more time to go to zero. So it's basically B determines how fast the oscillations will be damped, or in other words, how fast the energy loss will be. So it depends on the parameter B. Now, if you remember the position was X equals A, the amplitude times cosine theta. So indeed for the black one, the position, the formula for the position is A times cosine omega T. But for the blue one, since the amplitude now depends on time because of this extra term comes here. So we have a function like this. So that means there is going to be oscillations with the same frequency, remember, omega is equal to two pi frequency, which is two pi frequency is one over t. So again, there's going to be the oscillations with the same frequency, but those oscillations will be damped, will go down. So they will lose energy and go to zero like this. And this envelope function, this function outside is this exponential function. So this exponential function gives you this envelope and this cosine is still giving you these oscillating parts. So if the damping constant B is small, what happens? It oscillates a few times before stopping. So before the energy goes to zero, it still makes a couple of oscillations. It could be two oscillations and maybe one million oscillations, but still the point here is before the energy becomes zero, it makes some number of oscillations. So this type of motion is called underdamped. What does it mean? It means the system is damped, the energy is going down, but it can still make oscillations. So it's not that much damped in a sense. So under means it's not that much damped, it's damped, but it can still do oscillations. Okay, for a certain value of B, so there is a value, a specific value of B, where the oscillator stops making oscillations and it simply, uh, it simply relaxes. It simply, simply relaxes to the equilibrium. So instead of making oscillations, it cannot even do one oscillation. It just goes to zero like this. See, you don't see any oscillations here. So that's referred to as critically damp situation. So you, so it was making some oscillations. So you increase B and it comes to a certain value that at exactly at that value, it does not, it cannot anymore make any oscillations. If you increase B, then that means critically damped situation. So you have, let's say an oscillator, just like in the previous case, let's say you uh, stretch it Let's say this is the equilibrium position, x equals zero. So you stretch it and then you release it. What happens is it goes down here first and then down here first, and then down here to the equilibrium point. And it cannot go down below zero. So it stops here. So that's critically damped. So it basically, goes relaxes to the equilibrium point without making even one oscillation. So this is called critically damped. Now, if B is even greater, then it will relax to equilibrium at a much greater time. And that's called over damped system. Now you can say, you can ask, okay, what is the difference between over damped? Over damped means too much damped and critically damped. Well, the, the difference is, uh, think of over, so think of critically damped as the border between over damped and the under damped cases. So critically damped is just the border. So that means if, so let's say B critically BC. So if you decrease B a little bit from this situation, then it becomes under damped. So it makes oscillations. 
And if you increase it a little bit, then it becomes overband, overdamped. It does not make any oscillation. So critically damped is basically the border between uh, underdamped and overdamped. So in both, but if you look at the picture, uh, it shows it. So both critically damped and overdamped act as shown in this picture. So no oscillations, it just goes back to the equilibrium point without making even one oscillation. Now the last section is about driven oscillations and resonance. Driven means you push something that you apply force to create oscillation. So an example is the swing. Uh, so this is the driver. So that driver is driving this swing with certain force. So this is driven oscillations. So if you push someone on the swing with frequency F, so let's say this person is pushing the swing with frequency F, that is close to the natural frequency F0. So this spring, uh, swing, it has some natural frequency F0, and that natural frequency, this looks like a pendulum, it will depend on uh, the length and the mass. So that, that's just constant number. F0 is just constant, it's the natural frequency. But F is not constant. So you can, you know, you can push the swing with different uh, frequencies. You can push the swing with high frequency or low frequency. So this can change. But if you tune your pushing frequency equal to or close to the natural frequency of the swing, then something happens. The amplitude, which means the maximum height, so the amplitude, you can think of uh, the po this point, the swing goes back and forth between these points. Let's say we can say the amplitude, we can, uh, we can quantify it as the height. So this is the amplitude if you want, or this maximum point, say this is zero point. So um, the amplitude maximum height of the swing increases. So again, when does that maximum happens? If the driver, the frequency of the applied force is close or equal to the natural frequency of the swing. And this is called resonance. So this F, the force F, the frequency of the force and the frequency, the natural frequency of the swing, when they are equal or very close to each other, the resonance between them occurs. So, and you get maximum amplitude. But if you push at a much lower frequency or much higher frequency, then the swing's speed will not increase. That's why when you push someone on the swing, you push the, that person with certain frequency. You don't really push the person really, really at high frequency or low frequency. So there's a certain frequency. You know that, you learn it when you were a kid, that if you push someone at that specific frequency, then the person on the swing it gets the maximum speed or the maximum amplitude. And you can see that from this animation. Let's say we have this swing or pendulum. If you drive it too slowly, let's say your hand is here and you are um, kind of pushing back and forth. You drive it with certain frequency F, but it's too slow. If it's too slow, the amplitude, you can see that the amplitude is really small. But what happens if you push it back and forth, you can in fact tr try the same thing with the swing. If the driving frequency is too fast, then again, the amplitude doesn't become large. But if you push this or back and forth with your hand at this point with frequency F, which is at or close to the natural frequency of the swing, then you get the maximum amplitude as you can see. Now, what is that F0? What is the natural frequency of the swing? 
it's one over period of the swing and the period of the swing is given by this formula if you remember and it depends on the length of the swing and the gravity acceleration of the gravity so if you have a different swing uh, or pendulum which uh, of which length is different then its period is different and its natural frequency will be different so you have to swing it at a different frequency to get the maximum amplitude. But the point here is the resonant occurs if that the, the frequency of the force, which is here, your hand, it's coming from the, your hand, when it matches the natural frequency of the object or the system, or in this case, it's the pendulum, then you get the maximum swing or maximum amplitude. So this is called resonance. So resonance happens in this case. So if this is another example of resonance, if you scream with frequency F, so when you scream um, your vocal cords, they basically create some voice at certain frequency. And if that frequency of your scream voice that is at or very close to the natural frequency of the glass you make you uh, the glass starts oscillating like this at its uh, natural frequency and resonant resonance will occur so your voice will increase the amplitude of the oscillations just like in the previous slide just like here see when resonance happens, you get the maximum amplitude. So your voice will increase the amplitude of the oscillations in the glass and the glass will break finally. But again, let's say if the natural frequency of the glass is F0, it depends on the shape of the glass the material that the glass is made of so it has it depends on a lot of things but it's depends on the properties of the glass so if you scream at a frequency that's much smaller than natural frequency of the glass or much greater than the natural frequency of the glass it will not oscillate it will not even you know it will not break it will not even oscillate this oscillation happens only when your scream and your frequency, the frequency of your voice when you scream, is close to the natural frequency of the glass. So F0 is about glass, F is about your voice. You can change the frequency of your voice but the fre natural frequency of the glass, it's fixed because it depends on the properties of the glass. Also, the friction and air resistance will try to slow down or dampen the swing. So when you have a swing, and if you don't push it, it will ultimately, it will slow down because and stop because of the air resistance or the friction. On the other hand, the person pushing the swing will speed up the swing. But if you push it, you, will, you can always give it an energy. So if these two effects are in balance, so the friction and the external force, then the swing amplitude will remain the same not increase or decrease. So if those two effects are the same, then the swing will uh, go back and forth without changing its amplitude. The other thing that we have to talk about here is the resonance curves. Now here, this plot is amplitude. Remember, amplitude is this distance, how much it goes back and forth. Here it's less, but here in the middle, it's, it's more. So the amplitude versus, now this x, the horizontal axis is not time, it's frequency here. So the, these are different resonant 
resonance curves, they um, for each one, the value of damping, the damping constant B is different. So resonance curves show that maximum amplitude occurs if the external driving force is frequency F. Remember your hand here, it applies the frequency F, applies the force with frequency F. So uh, if the external driving forces frequency F is at or close to the natural frequency of F0, F0 depends on the properties of the pendulum, which, which is basically depends on L and G. So the resonance curves show these relations. So if you make this back and forth motion at different frequencies, you get different amplitudes. So for example, if you uh, do this motion, pushing and pulling back and forth at a slow frequency, so this is low frequency, you can see that the amplitude is small. If you do it too fast, like here, the applied frequency F, which is here. If, so for this one, again, the amplitude is low. But there's a certain frequency. In fact, if it's exactly at, so if you move this object here back and forth, exactly at a frequency that matches the natural frequency of this pendulum, then you get the maximum amplitude. You can see that the amplitude is maximum. So there are different curves here. Again, as I said, they correspond to different damping constants B. If the damping is large, then that means here, the resonance will occur, but you will get amplitude this much. If the damping is small, that means the energy loss is small. At the resonance point, you will get much more amplitude. So at this point. But in each case, you can see that the amplitude becomes maximum when the driving force here is equal or close to the natural frequency of the pendulum. Now in Washington, there's this famous, there was this famous bridge, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. You can uh, look it up on YouTube, it's still famous. It collapsed due to wind that caused torsional or twisting movements of the bridge at its natural frequency, F0. So the bridge also has certain natural frequency for these torsional movement. So these are real footages uh, that were taken in, uh, in the 40s. So this is, again, this, uh, the, the bridge uh, collapsed in 1940. And this uh, phenomenon is related to natural frequency. It is caused by the wind. So when you have a wind, it causes this motion. It's just like the, um, if you have a paper and if you, uh, if you turn on the hair dryer, so if you have the, let's say, hair dryer, and if you blow air to a, a piece of paper, so what happens is the, the paper flutters, right? The paper flutters. This, this is the same idea. So there's this wind and you get these the torsional movements in, in the bridge. And again, this has something to do with the natural frequency of the bridge. This is not exactly due to resonance as in the case of breaking a glass since the external force wind here is not period periodic. So we don't really have, so the wind can be constant. So uh, we can't really talk about in this case, the frequency of the wind. So it's not exactly resonance, but it's resonance like moment. Of course, uh, the engineers learned how to build bridges after this incident. So modern bridges have aerodynamic designs and dampers. Remember, damping is related to um, 
decreasing the energy. So uh, that prevent torsional oscillation. So there are specific designs where the wind cannot excite these oscillations. Or also there are some dampers. If any of these oscillations happens, those dampers actually decrease the energy of these oscillations. So we don't get these um, accidents anymore. The idea of resonance is also related to radius. So different radio channels have different frequencies. Like you can think of these frequencies as natural frequencies. So each radio channel has its own frequency in Hertz. So for example, this is 100 Hertz, 100.2 Hertz. So these are in Hertz. So your radio can pick up any frequency F. So F can be changed. If you change this knob, it changes the frequency of the radio. When you want to listen to a specific channel, you tune your radio's frequency F to the frequency of the channel F0. Let's say you want to listen to a TRT RB, then you have to tune, you have to change this F of the radio so that it matches one uh, hundred and one point four. This way, resonance occurs. So the radio of the, the frequency of the radio matches the frequency of the radio channel, and your radio picks up the broadcast signals only from that frequency, not others. So if you tune it, if you tune this F to one hundred one point four, you only listen listen to TRT RIB, not the other ones. This is also resonance. We will revisit this subject in chapter 24 when we deal with alternating current circuits. So that's all for this video. See you in the next lecture.